Mr. Uh, Deputy Secretary General, uh, thank you very much for talking to uh, us at uh, Diplomatic Connections. Um, and I want to start off by saying that I've looked up your uh, job description in on the UN web, and it's enormous. Um, it seems to me that it boils down to the fact that what the what the Secretary General isn't doing at any given point, you're doing. Uh, but is there something which actually um, attracts you or, or, or uh, you consider to be more important than any of all the other things which you also do? Well, of course, in the United Nations, you, you tend to focus on uh, today's crisis and uh, that absorbs uh, all uh, oxygen and, uh, and takes up all energy. Syria has been uh, very much an issue for Secretary General and myself these days, Central African Republic. But I hope that I will not lose touch with the uh, long-term objectives that we have to work for, prevention of conflicts and uh, development. Uh, when I was President of the General Assembly 2005 and 6, uh, we uh, decided on a formula which summarizes the work of the United Nations. There is no peace without development, and there is no development without peace, and none of the above without respect of human rights and the rule of law. And in my work as Deputy Secretary General, having a bit of convening power, hopefully inside the UN system, I can bring these different elements together. And that, I think, is a, a new trend, which is positive, that we try to uh, integrate uh, security, development, and human rights. Bring out the fact that you, you were, of course, on the outside as well as you were on the inside. It strikes me that uh, as a, a foreign minister, you um, had one uh, perception of the UN, and, and now that you're inside it, do you feel that there were things which you really didn't know, which now you've discovered, and you think, oh, gee, is that how it works? Well, I, I asked myself the other day, actually, what is new? in today's global landscape. I started to work with the UN in 1980 when I helped mediate in the Iran-Iraq war. And then for over 30 years, I have had different functions inside the United Nations and in my own government. And I asked myself, what, are, what is the new global landscape? And of course, you can't deny there have been geopolitical, geoeconomic shifts, first of all, to the East, Asia, economically. Uh, but also politically, I think you see an, uh, a geopolitical, geoeconomic shift in that direction. You have the huge changes in information and communication technology. And the, f the fact this as a social, economic, political factor also, which I think is underestimated, which wasn't the case when I started back in those days, 1980 above all. You have uh, the uh, new issues, the new global issues, climate, climate change. Did your parents, did my parents talk about climate change? No. It's a new factor which has to do with sustainability. We have to ask ourselves, what is the future of this planet? Other trends which are new, fortunately, is the role of women. This century will be the century of women, I'm pretty sure. First time in history. Then we have very troubling new phenomena which really engage us, and that is whether Youth unemployment, for instance, is systemic, is structure, structural. I hope to God it isn't, because it would, have be, would be a tremendous burden and tremendous tragedy uh, if that were the case. I just mentioned a few of these new factors. And my view is that if this is the new global landscape, how does the UN adapt to this? And here I come back to my point that we need to have a holistic view, bring together the different elements, security, development, human rights and rule of law, as a model of work. Work rather horizontally and not vertically, which bureaucracies tend to do, both in governments and in international organizations. And by that, we are more adapted, I think, to this uh, new global landscape. And uh, I've seen changes, and I, I, I really think it's important that we adapt to them and find a role in that new landscape. But uh, you haven't mentioned religious fundamentalism, which is also uh, I, sh I should have mentioned that also. I, I, I picked up some of that I thought about right now. But of course, we are extremely worried about uh, polarization and, uh, and dividing uh, of people in uh, ethnic, religious, sectarian uh, terms. 
We see that uh, in practically every conflict today, Syria. Uh, we see it in Central African Republic. Uh, we see it on the larger scale of Shia and Sunnis, and then Christians in the Middle East and so forth. It's a huge uh, challenge, huge issue. Uh, it is not new, but it has become dramatically evident that we need to deal with this much more seriously and than how, in the past. I'm sorry, and how does the uh, UN institutionally um, change to cope with this? Or has it changed to cope with Well, that's our challenge. And here I say we have to do more, we have to do better. And not only the United Nations, the problems that you and I have enumerated now are problems that United Nations alone cannot solve or even deal with effectively. We have to engage uh, on the economic front, the Bretton Woods system, World Bank, IMF, regional economic banks. We need to engage regional organizations like European Union, African Union, uh, uh, other regional organizations, ASEAN, etc. We need to engage the private sector for technology, for jobs, for uh, innovation. We need to engage civil society and parliaments, the public opinion. After all, the United Nations, three words, the first three words of the Charter is, we the peoples. Mm -hmm. What we do right. here must right. be meaningful for the peoples and people out there in the, in the, in the field and, and in, in the, uh, among the population of the member states. So I think we need to reach out to be, in some cases, in the lead, but in some cases, except to be a catalyst or part of other actors working on these issues. Is this um, a signal for the much-discussed um, UN reform that everybody... Uh, yeah. Yes, you know, the, one of the... Uh, one of the... Yes, one of the, the, the important issues we are discussing both among ourselves in the Secretariat uh, and with the Member States is the degree of partnerships that needs to be developed in order for us to deal with these global issues. Uh, and that means how do we engage uh, with outside actors uh, and still retain uh, our own mandates and do our own job, but see it as part of the whole. That is one of the most important debates we have about reform. And then, of course, you have, you have other reforms which is, are not within the realm of my responsibility, but. Uh, which of course are crucial for the future of the organization, and that is the reform of the Security Council, right. which is uh, an extremely difficult issue. I, I recall when I was president of the General Assembly that that negotiation was the most difficult one. But it doesn't seem to have uh, moved. Very no, it's, uh, it, the, the, this issue is related to national interest to a right. degree that uh, no other part of the UN is engaged in. And uh, when the national interests get involved, and competing national interests get involved, then this issue becomes so much more difficult. Uh, there is a discussion about the legitimacy and the representativity of the United Nations uh, with the present uh, configuration, particularly on those who have veto power. That discussion continues, and it is very, very evident among some, not least the emerging powers that they want to have a stronger voice. But I think there will also be a discussion about the use of the veto, to what degree the use of the veto could be limited. There was a very interesting French proposal uh, a couple of months ago when they, uh, the French suggested that when it comes to mass crimes, mass atrocities, uh, the veto should not be applied. So it's a sign that there is a discussion about the sometimes far too frequent use of the veto or the threat of the use. So the way of circumventing the veto might possibly be to list situations in which it would not be applicable? I'm not the one to, to carry on that discussion. When I was Foreign Minister of Sweden, I could. But now I'm international civil servant. It's in the hands of member states. But I noted with interest that the French pointed the direction of limitation of the use of veto for certain situations. But member states uh, on their own are not going to um, uh, agree on any change unless uh, someone is... Has the UN got no authority to push in a certain direction if, if it feels that that would, uh, uh, that, that would improve uh, representation or...? Uh, but we would, of course, like to have as strong a Security Council as possible and as legitimate a Security Council as possible, but this is issue is definitely in the hands of Member States. Sometimes we pay the price 
for the uh, lack of unity in the Security Council, most recently the, uh, the Syria situation, of course, where we for so long have been waiting for unity. Finally, we saw unity when the, uh, when the use of chemical weapons was, was right. proved. And that led to the present process of destroying the chemical weapons uh, of Syria. And that is the result of a unified Security Council resolution. We would have liked to have seen that unity when Kofi Annan was uh, mediating, when Lakta Brahimi is now at it. That would have given uh, them more muscular power mm -hmm. in dealing with the parties. And uh, anything that can be done to improve the uh, working of the Security Council is, of course, welcome for us. If Lake success were now, um, would we end up with the United Nations at all? Well, my line is that if we were to abolish the United Nations, we would uh, have to rush tomorrow to start the negotiations about a new UN Charter. And uh, I think we would be surprised to notice how similar that new charter would be to the present one. The most sensitive issue would be the veto <laughs> powers. Right. But That's apart true. from that, uh, this charter is a model, I think, for any organization. Uh, to me, it's diplomatic poetry. I have it at my desk. Right. Uh, I have it in my pocket, in fact, my back pocket. And I could show it to prove it, but I won't. Uh, and uh, the uh, first three words, we the peoples, and then the principles and purposes of the United Nations, to me, sets the direction and gives me a lot of help in my work. But the, but the uh, veto might not be in the hands of the same people, or perhaps it would still be in there. <laughs> Let's not speculate right. in that. Well, <laughs> you mentioned Syria uh, more than once, and I think uh, that's now the important issue to facing the UN. Uh, what can the UN, I mean, the UN, of course, uh, is involved very much in the, in the refugee uh, issue, um, which is supposed to be one of the largest refugees problems uh, ever, uh, ever to, uh, to happen. Um, what is the UN doing as far as the refugee situation is concerned, and what can it do that it isn't doing? I was in uh, Be uh, I was in Lebanon and in the neighborhood of Syria, uh, in refugee uh, reception uh, centers uh, in December, and there were at that time 150,000 refugees in uh, almost exactly a year ago. Today we have 850,000 in a country which is already at that time, which was already at that time strained by the pressures on schools, health clinics, jobs. You can imagine that pressure today being five or six times higher than it was when I was there a year ago. Jordan is under similar pressures. Uh, Turkey is also, but has, of course, a larger population and reception capacity. Iraq. Uh, the problem is, of course, uh, that the Refugee flows also reflect, unfortunately, what we talked about earlier, the sectarian and ethnic and religious elements. So uh, this conflict is, of course, not only a conflict in Syria. It is a potential conflict. It is already a conflict, but could it be even worse in, Be in, in Lebanon, Lebanon and in, uh, in Jordan? And uh, Tripoli, I think there are 40% uh, Syrians in Tripoli now, the second city of, uh, of Lebanon. Uh, and therefore, uh, this is a huge humanitarian problem, but it is also a political problem. 9.5 million people, Syrians, are in need of humanitarian, are in, in, in desperate need of humanitarian assistance. 2.2 million people live abroad, and out of these 2.2 million, half of them are children. So today, there are a million kids, girls and boys, in these squalid conditions. And now, by the way, with this horrible winter, it's a very tough winter right now, it's just unacceptable. We are doing everything we can, but it's, it's a huge task. We're grateful that the ICRC and the non-governmental organizations and the Syrian Red Crescent also, by the way, are working so well. But still, we have 2.5 million people probably that we can't reach. And uh, this is a great humanitarian challenge, both inside Syria and in the region. Then, of course, there are two other developments that we should point to when it comes to Syria. One is, of course, the chemical weapons destruction, which I think is good news. 
Uh, and uh, by the middle of next year, we hope that all Syrian chemical weapons in Syria are, are gone and destroyed. Uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that we could set up together with the OPCW, the body in mm -hmm. Hague that works on this uh, so quickly, this organization. Uh, and uh, I commend my colleagues for doing that job so efficiently. The last issue is the most important one, uh, that is to stop this war. And uh, we now uh, are preparing for the talks to start in Switzerland uh, in, uh, on the 22nd of January. Yeah. We are in contact with the, the parties, of course, but also with uh, Russia and the US, which play a very important role for this process. And Lakta Ibrahimi is working day and night in the preparations together with our staff here in New York. And we hope that we will be able to uh, move in the direction of a uh, solution based on the uh, agreement that Kofi Annan negotiated on the 30th of June last year, which talks about the need to set up a governing body with full, full executive powers. Uh, and then later, of course, uh, let the Syrian people decide through uh, their free choice uh, what kind of government they want to have. To set up elections. You know. That's, of course, the next stage. The, what the uh, 30th of June document uh, prescribes is that uh, the, the negotiation should see as a central task uh, how such a transitional body with full executive powers could come about. But as far as the um, uh, insurgency is concerned, uh, will will they be talking to the right to the, to the right people? We, I've been involved in several uh, mediations uh, in the past, and of course the normal uh, procedure, the normal consequence of starting talks is, of course, that you have a reduction of uh, violence. Right. In the best of cases, in the best of cases, cessation of hostilities, even a right. form of ceasefire. I don't know whether we can expect this to happen before the 22nd of January, but I hope that all countries and actors on this scene will move in the direction of requiring from both sides to reduce the level of violence so that we create a climate conducive to a settlement. Uh, whether then the negotiation team in Geneva will have full support of the different actors in the field is a very important and difficult and relevant question. Uh, there, is been, there has been quite a, uh, a uh, proliferation of different right. movements uh, and uh, of different uh, political and religious and uh, sectarian color. And uh, it is a problem, of course, to, to identify uh, the um, negotiation team in Geneva that can speak on behalf of as many Syrians as possible. But it's, but it's not something that, is, uh, that hasn't yet been determined. This is, we have a meeting in Geneva uh, next, on uh, next this week, week, this week uh, on the 20th, right. and uh, where we will discuss this uh, with, the, uh, with the US and Russia and uh, with Mr. Brahimi and um, our staff uh, present. And I think decisions will be taken at that meeting uh, hopefully on the delegations, uh, not only among the Syrians, but also which other delegations uh, bring, could be uh, invited this, to the talks. Shouldn't this also bring in uh, Gulf states that have seem to have an interest in what's going on? Right now we have around 30 countries that have expressed an interest Probably, to, to be present at the talks. And uh, it is up to the meeting this Friday to decide uh, on the road forward. Is there a... Uh, specific number that one should have? I mean, no, there's no number. Is no. Well, this is, uh, this is not for the concrete negotiations. Uh, you will most probably have a, an opening uh, right. session with the numbers possibly uh, right. around that number, although one could perhaps uh, try to reduce it. But it is up to the people who meet on Friday. Uh, but then, of course, the real negotiations will have to take place between the Syrians. With the, with the assistance of Lakta Brahimi, of course, and his team. And, and, and not with any of the outside uh, uh, Well, powers. no, I think that the, 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 my experience of negotiations is the, the more the parties on the ground can talk together, the better chances to achieve results. On the other hand, there is a need, of course, for the main organizers, UN, Russia, and the US, right, to, be, I mean. to be in contact with the different parties. They, they, they play a role, of course, in pushing the parties to a solution.
But I mean, how, how close are we at this point to one of the elements which I think needs to be addressed, uh, and that is um, the willingness of the current uh, uh, leadership in Syria to uh, just get out of the way? Well, now you enter an area which I'm not uh, neither authorized nor able to, to speculate about. Uh, and what I'm trying to say is, do you actually have any indications other than what is generally known about uh, the intentions of uh, Biden? Well, the very fact that our, the indications are that both sides will come to the I negotiation see. table, it's, it's and that we as a premise for these negotiations have stated that it is the the formula of Kofi Annan on 30th of June, which is the basis for talks, is to me the beginning of the talks. And then we hope that we will find some formula. But that's what the negotiation right. is all about. And it's up to the Syrians, of course, they have to, to decide uh, on the, what kind of future they want uh, their country to have and how they end this horrible conflict. And then it's up to the member states who can influence their decisions to push them to finally end this nightmare. All conflicts end in talks, so they don't end at all. End exactly. It. No, but, you know, I've heard so much about military victory. Uh, I hope you saw the quotation marks. Yeah. Uh, because even, first of all, I don't believe in military victory in this case. Uh, there was talk about military victory from both sides different times right. during the last two years, two yeah. and a half years. And what happened? Look, we have the nightmare continuing. But even if we were to find even if there were to be a so-called military victory, right. you would probably just prepare the ground for another horror. When the revenge starts, when the mobilization on the other side starts again, if there is no sure. agreement on a peaceful future of the country. So uh, it's very futile to believe in, in uh, military victory. And if that realization is strong enough among the parties and those who can influence the parties, then we are, are hopeful that we will achieve results. But it's is, not easy. Is a peacekeeping force uh, to separate them uh, possible? It has been discussed, but it's far too early to, 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 to discuss. Uh, that suggests a, a division of the country? Not necessarily. But uh, it is far too early to talk about that, whether there is a need for a stabilizing uh, force after an agreement. So uh, is this the thing that occupies most of your time these days, or are there? Uh, you it is. It is the uh, issue that occupies us uh, and has occupied us most. I would say in the last few years, I went to the Secretary General the last fall. I remember in October, and I told him that uh, Lakta Ibrahimi was going to see President Assad, and uh, the Secretary General asked me when. I said in 10 days' time, because he was on a, right. uh, a traveling in the region. And then he looked at me rather sadly, Secretary, and said, listen, 10 days, that's between 1,000 and 1,500 people killed. So he counted not the days, but the number of people dying, 100, 150 every day. So that, I think, demonstrates uh, how we feel about this. And we really hope that we can end this horrible war as soon as possible. The, um, we talked about the peacekeeping force a, a few minutes ago. Um, the, peace, the UN peacekeeping force in Cyprus uh, has an extremely good record, I think, of uh, keeping everybody um, apart. And, uh, but, but in other countries, it's perhaps, its record is more mixed, I should think. Um, is, what, what is it that would require would, that would bring um, a more reliable uh, formula to this uh, deployment? Well, first of all, I, I, would, uh, I would just add on, on Cyprus that, yes, uh, we haven't had open warfare or military confrontation. On the other hand, the basic problems still remain. So uh, peacekeeping operations cannot be used to cement a situation which is, in fact, detrimental for long-term peace and security. But, but if they're, they, they, they're non-cementable, it's a very good way to... Yeah, well, I mean, well and, 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 and you're right. I mean, I, I, I myself negotiated the uh, ceasefire between, together with Russia, I must say, <coughs> in Nagorno-Karabakh. Yes, right. 
And when I am commended for that, I say, well, I, it's okay, fine. And people don't kill each other, but the basic problem still remains. <laughs> and you have the same thing in Cyprus. But of course, it is much better to have a situation where you don't see no f see any fighting. You are right. We, the and it may, of course, I mean, just, can I just push this a little further? It may, of course, be the solution which is that you uh, indeed end up with two Cyprus. There's no real reason. Well, I wouldn't why. go that far, definitely not. No, I think with, there are still aspirations to find a formula. Yes. Kofi Annan had a good uh, proposal in 2005, yeah. I think yeah. it was, four, five. And, and, and uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are working we hard on it and hope that the talks will start soon. And I hope also there will be a more long-term solution, of course, for Nagorno-Karabakh that I just mentioned. Right. And you have another of those uh, is very long-standing conflicts, the Middle, the Middle East, uh, Israel-Palestine. Yeah. But if I go to the second part of your question, the, the new generation of peacekeeping, yes, you're right. It, it, we are seeing more and more difficult challenges. Uh, the classical peacekeeping, uh, where UN maintained easily its neutrality and partiality, are not as common as they were in the past. Uh, we usually had international conflicts, we were watching over a ceasefire line or something like that. Today we are often in internal uh, conflicts, right. civil wars. You stabilize the situation, the fighting may still go on right. or be, be very much threatening to explode in everybody's face. Uh, we are still there and we go in there and we need to have both the classical peacekeeping component but we also need to have a more muscular component to deal with the threats, which come, for instance, in the case of Mali, yeah. from extremist or terrorist groups, or from different groups in DRC, Congo, mm -hmm. where you have uh, risk of military conflagration, and therefore you have what we, in this case, call intervention brigade. Right. Uh, intervention brigade. This, in turn, of course, when they are being used, will make will challenge uh, the uh, impartiality and neutrality uh, in, inside the country. Yeah, and, sure. and the people who could be exposed in such situations, or in such situations is, of course, humanitarian workers, right. uh, human rights observers, civilian personnel. So uh, it is, it is uh, an issue we discuss practically every day in our new operations, uh, to, to combine the classic neutral, impartial UN presence with having that muscular capacity when we meet with uh, what is called sometimes asymmetrical threats, which right. is a euphemism for terrorism. Which is a euphemism for terrorism. But, but it's basically the same uh, military component that you... That you no, made. in the case of Mali and, uh, and the DRC, the there are separate components. No, in Mali it is it's mainly the French component, and it's still oh, 2000, over right. 2,000, perhaps to be reduced uh, in Bamako. Uh, and in uh, in uh, DRC, it's an intervention brigade which is identified. But you are right; it's probably difficult in 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 uh, situations where conflict erupts to draw that line so clearly. I mean, does one actually? Uh, I don't know. I think the example of the Brazilians in Haiti, uh, they sometimes find themselves. In. Yeah. Well, that's that's another type of situation where we fortunately don't have sort of military threats. It's most maintaining security. Right. Right. But that's, but, but I mean, originally it began, uh, I mean, I was, you were talking to somebody who actually saw what was possibly one of the first ones, and that was the, the Indians in the Congo, and then, this was in the 60s, and then Early the, 60s. the Indians in Cyprus, mm -hmm. which was the original, yeah. what the, yeah. before it became uh, this multinational. Uh, I know what you're talking about. Sweden right. was in both places also, both places. at that time. Both in Congo and Cyprus, and early on. Sweden is still in, the, in Cyprus, if I Very few, if any. Uh, we, I remember moving Kings. our staff to Lebanon. Yes, I forget who are there now. But uh, we were in Congo. Uh, what about the Middle East in general? Um, well, not the Middle East, the Arab world. The Arab springs that appear to have gone sour all over the place for one reason or another. Uh, is that something the UN of course, we we uh, we are very interested in in what happens in, in the countries uh, in that region. Uh, there were high hopes when uh, the changes uh, came about uh, about uh, deeper respect of the uh, desire of the majority of people, and modernization, and so forth. But I think many of us warned already at that time that this would be 
a bumpy ride mm -hmm. that we will see ups and downs and and uh, I think we need to take a longer perspective on this process. It's it's going to be uh, progress. It's going to be setbacks. What I find very interesting is the importance of institutions. Right. If you look at one present example of a country which is in a difficult situation now, it's Libya. Right. Libya is still a population of around five million people, right. I think. They have oil, uh, so right. they could easily uh, get the resources. Mm -hmm. Still, you see huge problems uh, coming from uh, terrorists moving into southern Libya, Li Libya, a clown culture, a historical uh, tribalism. baggage, tribalism, baggage, uh, tribalism, of course. But uh, here comes my point: with the disappearance of uh, Gaddafi, everything that assembled uh, looked like institutions were gone. The, the, all the institutions were related to the Gaddafi right, uh, uh, leadership structure. And now you, have, you don't have those institutions. And I say this because I find it extremely important now when we devise the course, and I'd just like to say a few words about that, yeah. for the post-2015 development agenda. We have right. Millennium Development Goals, yeah. very important uh, for the period 2000-2015. We are now starting the negotiations of member states on the, the next set of goals, which have to contain poverty eradication, sustainability. Right. We have no planet B. We have to remem remember sure. that. But we also have to think of Qualitative, ele qualitative elements like good institutions. And because if you don't have those institutions, things fall apart so easily. Look at uh, post-Afghanistan crisis, uh, Somalia, and now this example of uh, Libya, although I don't want to compare them with the two, two earlier examples. The institutions make sure that we can achieve the poverty eradication and stand up for sustainability. If we don't have strong, honest, well-functioning institutions, things don't work. So this is what I, one of my main conclusions from watching uh, the Arab mm -hmm. Spring or Arab Ren Re Renaissance is that uh, the importance of setting up credible institutions which can really make sure that you can go the road you want, but not only politically, but economically and socially, that is such a great asset. Uh, but the Egyptians had institutions. I mean, they were perhaps institutions that required yeah. uh, correction. Yeah. Uh, particularly the Tunisians had institutions, yeah. which I think are... Mm. Um, and and Tunisia is still the example, uh, is one a good, good example. Right. They, they, that's why I think the, the developments in Tunisia are, are still encouraging. Tell me about the Millennium, uh, uh, the new Millennium Goals. Uh, it, uh, is all this on track, or has it? Uh, yes, we, we have had a very good uh, good year behind us, preparing the ground. Uh, we have had a high level panel uh, delivering results. Uh, we have the United Nations Development Program doing consultations, reaching out to one million people actually mm -hmm. to to hear what are the people, what are the desires of the people of the world. And uh, we had a meeting in uh, the General Assembly. The uh, member states gave, came up with a very good document at the Millennium Development Goal uh, meeting on the 25th of September. Now they are soon negotiating the Sustainable Development Goals. And we will have also discussion on financing for development. These strands will come together. And uh, by next year, we will prepare the ground for the talks the this main yeah, negotiations right. that will start at the beginning of 2015 and then hopefully present a m model of the MDGs for the period 2015 to 2030, where I would think that, that these three elements uh, will be part. One, public education, okay. two, sustainability, and I think in today's world you cannot divide sustainability from public education. Right. We need to bring them together. And the last element that I hope the member states will, will, will health. is health is part of the public eradication, of course. Uh, there, there, there are certain aspects which, where we have made progress, education, primary education. Uh, there has been a reduction of extreme poverty, mainly through progress in Asia. But then there are areas where you are really lagging, uh, maternal health, unfortunately, right. and sanitation which is a huge problem, uh, not least related to urbanization. Yeah, uh, also and related to water. And water, deficient water, the lack of water, lack of clean water. I mean, 
just listen to my figures. 780 million people don't have safe drinking water. 2.5 billion people don't have sanitation. Euphemism again for toilets. And this is the reason why, and this is an unbelievable figure to many, more than 2,000 children under the age of five die every day in diarrhea, dysentery, dehydration, cholera. And I've seen them die in front of my own eyes. That's why the Secretary asked me to launch a call for action on sanitation, which we did this spring. Right. And we hope that by that we will move this most lagging of goals forward so that we at least can present progress by 2015. But we still have work to do in that sector. But doesn't all this uh, uh, depress you enormously? I mean, just well, I, 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 in a strange, day, in a strange, this, yes, uh, you're right, you're right. But in a strange way, uh, I get energy from both successes and failures. It's uh, when I see, when I see this uh, situation, I've seen it again with my own eyes in, in all, all parts of the world. Uh, I'm even more determined to uh, to mobilize my team to uh, and all of us to work in this direction. We can never give up. Can never give up. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Good to see you, Roland. Great to see you again. Well, thank you. Thank you.